We will be sharing this morning on the topic out and about. Out and about. And uh, our main text is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 17, from verses 16 to 17, verses 22 to 23, and verses 32 to 34. So Acts 17, 16 to 17, 22 to 23, 32 to 34. And I just read that. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. And then verse 22 says, So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God, this God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. And verses 32 to 34 says, When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, We want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him and became believers. Among them were Diocinius, a member of the council, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Many years ago, somebody came to talk to me about getting a car. And I saw the car, it was very nice, but I had a challenge with that uh, offer because uh, the model of the car is not one that you see regularly, you know, around. And I thought, hmm, because if you are getting a car, you've got to think about parts and, you know, the mechanics or the engineers knowing how to fix it if it has any problems. And that time, maybe I had seen about two or three around. So I kind of, you know, said to him that I'm not quite sure this is a good move for, for me because uh, I've got reservations about it. But not long after, I began to see the car around. Everywhere I turned to, the car was there. Initially, I thought, has he gone to mass produce this thing? Of course not. But you know, the mind plays games at times. And it took me a while before I could figure out what was going on. That it's all about focus. It's all about focus. Whatever you focus on, you attract. Whatever you focus on, you attract. Apostle Paul, apart from the fact that he became a Christian, the other thing I think has helped him or helped him to be a great achiever was because he was very focused. He knew what God had called him to do and he just focused on it. He just focused on it. If you read, if you're familiar with his writings, you, you, you can tell. He's not one that could be distracted. He knew where he was going and he just went straight for it. To focus is to have something as your central point of attraction, attention, 
or activity. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, this same Apostle Paul was saying something to us there. He says, we should think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. And I think what he was trying to say to us there is that we should be heavenly focused. We should seek to please heaven. But also, heaven has interest on earth. So heaven is also looking for people who would do their bidding. Because suddenly when a man becomes focused on heaven and what heaven, because heaven has their own opinion. We have our opinions on different things, but heaven, they have, they have theirs, and theirs is valid. You see, when heaven becomes your focus, you begin to get life transmissions. That's how I see it. Life transmissions, they begin to beam. Like you sit at home and you watch your Netflix or BBC or you know whatever we watch, and they are beaming it into your living room. That's how heaven functions. When they find a man who is focused, I read in the book of Acts 16 that Paul was going to the province of Asia and strangely the Bible says that the Holy Spirit prevented them from entering the place. And I thought, are they not going to do God's work? But even within God's work, within God's work. And that's the benefit of being connected to heaven. When you go on vacation, what are the things that you look out for? You look at the tourist attractions there. You look at the eateries where you guys can eat. Of course, the shops. Uh, Diola is nodding her head. <laughs> of course, the shops. You've got to know where the shops are. And I'm with you on that. But Paul arrived in Athens. And the Bible records that his spirit became troubled. Why? Because from the heavens they had tried to beam that Paul is in Athens. Go to District A. This is what is going on there. They were giving him a live feed. So he got there and he saw that idols were littered everywhere. Heaven had beamed it. What do you see? What do I see within my community? What is heaven saying to me about my neighborhood? What is heaven saying to me about this environment that I come to every week? The challenge with idols is that idols try to make a mockery. No one can make a mockery of God, but they try to make a mockery of who God is and what God stands for. You know, Jesus said, give 
to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And give to God what belongs to God. Worship is God's exclusive right. It's not meant for idols. It's meant only for God. And that's where in the book of Hosea chapter 14, God was speaking. He says, Israel, stay away from idols. I am the one that cares for you. I am the one that answers your prayer. Stay away. God wants us to stay away from idols. You see, idolatry takes the focus away from God, who is the source of everything. His label is on you and I. His handprint is all over the place. So it is the greatest fraud in human history. When the devil tells people that God is not the source of all things. So you can see why God gets angry with things like that. He is the source of all things. And yet, the devil is making people to think that God is not the source. But thank God for men like Paul. You know, the scripture says that we are the apple of God's eyes. When it gets to Paul, Paul turns it around. Anyone that messes with Jesus messes with Paul. That's how committed Paul was. Paul made it very obvious in so many ways. In so many ways. In his writings, he he starts the writing, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He and Jesus, five and six. They said to Paul, there is problem as you are going to Jerusalem. Paul said, I know. He said, but I'm bound by the Spirit. The Spirit says to me that as I'm going there, there lies suffering, there lies imprisonment. But my life is nothing except I complete the task that has been given to me. The task of sharing the good news. What a committed fellow. Paul was not going to turn a blind eye to idolatry. Anything that tampers with Jesus, tampers with Paul. Anything. It's not the other way around. I say, you tamper with me, you tamper with God. Paul says, no. You tamper with Jesus, you tamper with me. If Paul were alive today, how would life be? So many things will not happen under his watch. So many things should not happen under my watch as well. So what did Paul do? After he had gotten there and he had seen the problem, the Holy Spirit had beamed to him what was going on in the city. The Bible says that Paul went to the synagogue, the church. And he went to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And what was Paul saying to them? I believe Paul would have been saying, guys, what's going on here? What's going on under your watch? What's going on? 
what is going on? And I believe the heavens are asking us this morning, what is going on? What are we doing about the task that has been assigned to us? What else did Paul do? Paul reached out to the community of Athens. And I think we need to reach out. You know, we've been saying this for some time. But it's time for us to step out. Last week they were saying to us, and it's scriptural, we are the light of the world. That light of the world is huge responsibility. And the salt of the earth. Paul reached out. We must reach out. We must step out. We must take ownership. We must take responsibility for this work. It's the work of the Father. What else did Paul do? Paul affirmed the people. You see, affirmation is very important. He affirmed them, even though they were going off tangent. The people we meet, there is something good that we can see about them. Because when you affirm people, you're building the bridge. You're connecting to them. You become a bridge builder. You know what Paul said? He says, it appears that you guys are religious. That's affirmation. When we are planning to reach out to people, affirm them. What else did Paul do? Paul took an interest in them. He says, I've been around. I've seen all the altars. In fact, there is a particular one that I've seen with the inscription to an unknown God. He took an interest. He wasn't just speaking. We have to take an interest in the people we want to reach out to. Take an interest in the community that we are, you know, based in. Take an interest in our neighbors. Email marketing. I've learned now that when they want to market something to you by email, they address you by name. Did you know that? They address you by name in your email so that you can open it. Because you assume you're somebody who knows you. They are trying to connect. When we send emails and we send messages and we are saying to people, Hi, that conversation is dead on arrival. There is no connection. Because you have to show people that I have an interest in you. Address them by name. 
You see, you can see that Paul connected with them where they were. He didn't start by saying, oh, you people are, you know, idol worshippers. He just took it from there and they began to build upon it. He didn't break it down again. It was just from there. He picked it up from there. Paul told them something. And this is very important. He told them that God is the source of everything. You know, the, this challenge of idolatry is everywhere. Because it's the subset of sin. People have different goals for different things. When there is trouble, suddenly you hear someone say, please say prayer. Oh. So, you know you can say prayer. But when the prayer, when the problem finishes now, Paul told them that God is the source of everything. And that God has no need. We are the ones that have needs because we are dependent people. God is independent. He told them clearly. God has no needs. But he is able to satisfy all your needs. Including the need for salvation. You know, as human beings, we are very needy people. And we always gravitate to where the needs can be met. So God, or Paul, beg your pardon, was speaking to them, saying, look, all the needs you ever would have, can be met through Jesus. So you have no excuse. And then he told them that they have to. The Bible says clearly that God has commanded. It's not a plea. That God has commanded that everyone everywhere Nicaragua, Japan, wherever, everyone, everywhere must repent of their sins. It's not exclusive to Asia. Everywhere means everywhere. Must repent of their sins and turn to So we need to remind people, it's a command from God. Anyone that dies, it, because the provision has been made, so nobody has an excuse. And can I say something again, please? Everyone has a need. The most powerful man in the world has a need. The richest man in the world has a need. The Bible says that the blessings of God make it a man to be rich and adds no sorrow. So there are blessings that can add sorrow. Any blessing that is out of God will add sorrow. So we need to let people know that God has commanded that everyone, everywhere, should repent of their sins. Because judgment is coming. But the provision has been made anyway. But anyone that dies in their sins is condemned. You don't accept Jesus, that's it. Their fate is sealed. It's serious stuff. You go after idols. God says, I can meet all your needs. What's the problem then? All. Everything. Every need you can ever have can be met in the person of Jesus. So nobody has any excuse. 
and their needs, like the need for salvation, the need for forgiveness, those things can only be met in Jesus. Jesus was sent. He paid the penalty for our sins. He was killed. He died, buried, rose up on the third day. What evidence do we need again? It doesn't end here. There is afterlife. God says, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These people, though dead, still living. But I want to pick up something because I find out that many times it's not as if people don't know these things. But they have needs and it appears that if those needs are not solved, they think, or maybe they assume that God can meet all their needs. But we'll look at a story quickly and we'll use that as a case study. And compare it to what Paul did uh, to the people in Athens. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4 from verses 7 to 18. It says, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised. For Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I will give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you are greater than our ancestors Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons? and his animals enjoyed. Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you are right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands. And you aren't even mine to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. If we see this, we see similarities between how Paul approached the people in uh, Athens and how Jesus approached this woman. The first thing first is that Jesus reached out to her. 
Just like Paul reached out to the people of Athens. There's no use saying or imagining things. We've got to step out. If Jesus could step out, then we don't have any excuse. We don't. Jesus affirmed her. He says, give me water. Did he need her water? He didn't need her water. Even the food that they went to buy for him, he didn't eat it. He says, my food is to do the will of him who has sent me and to complete his work. He didn't need her water. But yet, Jesus affirmed her. Building bridges. And then, Jesus took an interest in her. Because Samaritan woman, it's clear, Jews and Samaritans don't see eye to eye. And the woman had a reputation. But regardless of that, Jesus took an interest. And then Jesus tied it to a need. He began to talk about living water. He had to connect it with something she could relate to. He says, if you know the one who is speaking to you, he's able to give you living water. That you will not even thirst again. Jesus tied it to a need. Whatever he was saying to her, he was tying it to a need. But the key thing here, the icing on the cake, is the issue about her husband. She's had five husbands. And then the man that was with her, who would have been the sixth, or the not married to her, Jesus said to her, go and get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, yes, you're right. You don't have a husband, you're right. You've married five people already, this one. But then she said something. At the end of that conversation, she said, Come and see a man who told me all I have ever done. Could he be the Messiah? What Jesus said to her was in all she had ever done. But according to that woman, that was the most important thing to her. And Jesus pressed the right button. Before then, it was you know back and forth, back and forth. But then, because Jesus is Jesus, he pressed the right button. And the challenge with her was that she was looking for love in the wrong places. But then Jesus made it clear to her. That you don't need to look for love in the wrong places. And offered her unconditional love. And that was what set. She left her jar and went back to the village and said, Come and see this man who told me all I have ever done. Could he be the Messiah? You see, when we start to reach out to people and we start to affirm them and we start to love them and we pray before we reach out to them, God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, can help us to speak along the lines of their needs. God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, can help us to speak along the lines of their needs. Now we might see them and think, oh, 
How am I going to be able to minister to these people? Just do it the right way and trust God for the outcomes. I will share a story with us quickly as I begin to wrap up. Just to buttress this. You see, there is no formal attitude. But if you do it the right way, you know, reach out to them, love them, affirm them, tell them the message of God, trust the Holy Spirit to allow you to speak. You don't even, you won't even know when you will say it. Many years ago, a friend of mine said to me, I want you to come and, I want to send some people to your place to come and do a presentation. They sell cookware. He's my friend. Nobody can tell me on the road, come and sell cookware. I won't listen to you. But because he's my friend and he said, you know, he's seen it, he wants me to come and, you know, he wants them to come. I said, that's fine. You know, bring them. And they came on a Friday night, many years ago now. It was a young lady. You know, the initial prep, trying to, you know, find out what you do and all. And then we just, you know, made her feel welcome. And then the presentation started uh, asking questions, doing all kinds of things. They prepared a meal, you know. But I kept on asking her, how much does this thing cost? <laughs> how much? He said, don't worry, don't worry. Ah, I said, I'm worried. I'm worried. Then you start to keep the thing, tell us. And then along the lines, you know, we spoke, you know, because we we'll take a break, we, you know, she was just trying to bond and connect. And she did a good job, I must, I must confess. And then we talked along the lines, say she's a Christian. Ah, I said, that's good. I said, we too, we are Christians. So I'm praying, because nothing is coming out of this pocket today. <laughs> nothing. You just talk and talk and talk. Of course, it's going to be civil when you're, you know, talking to people. They've come to your home, they, you know, but nothing is coming out of this pocket. When she now gave us the price, ah, I said, if this costs this, what are we going to prepare inside this thing? Because <laughs> I don't understand. I said, is it gold? They said, they mentioned somebody. I said, I don't understand what you're saying. This thing, but very focused lady, very focused. My wife was not even keen anyway. It was me that was, so by the time she gave the price, I just said, forget it, it's not going to happen. Let's just finish, it's Friday night, let's finish quickly, that we can go to bed. But I think she must have prayed. Because about 20 minutes to the end of the thing, one sentence, one sentence that she said. Unknown to her, my wife was pregnant, was seeing the GP for a particular issue, and she just mentioned it. Oh. <laughs> Verbatim, word for word. Hey. So I said, what did you say again? Of course she didn't know. How is she going to know? It's my first time of meeting her. But she said she's a Christian. She must have prayed that this sale must come through today. <laughs> I said, repeat yourself. What did you say about that? Thing? Say, yeah, it is. That was the buy. Almost four hours. One sentence. By the time she finished, we just signed it. <laughs> what am I saying? Let's reach out. Let's affirm these people. Let's take an interest in them. Let's share the urgency of God's message that God has commanded and that the provisions have been made and let's trust God for the outcomes. God bless.